You've got 10 seconds. The countdown going on right now. I'm sorry, I'm not doing it the wrong way. This is Play by Play Cast, the world's number one sports media podcast. Wait, what? Nobody's fact checking it. Just keep going. Here we go. Who the hell is Happy Gilmore? Got all that on camera, right, John? Sure, I did. All right, because the red light was not on. The podcast about play by play broadcasters for play by play broadcasters, hosted by a play by play broadcaster. Oh, you can stick me in some kind of Italian boat because that one is Gondola. Now, from New York. Really? All the big ones are from New York. Your host, Joe Godet. It's still Joel. Yeah, he will not be able to see very well, Cotton. All right, welcome back into another episode of Play by Play Cast. It is the podcast about play by play broadcasters for play by play broadcasters, hosted by a play by play broadcaster, a professional development podcast that dives into the tips, tips, tricks, experience, stories, process, and preparation of some of the biggest and best play by play announcers in the business. My name, of course, is Joel Godet, and you can find the pod on social media at PXPCast or by finding me at Joel Godet, J O E L G O D. E-T-T. Our guest today is a little bit of a change of pace. We have a guy who does do some play-by-play, but is most known for his work as an analyst on college lacrosse and as a sideline reporter on a variety of different sports for the ESPN family of networks. And that's Quint Kesnick, who I first became aware of when I was in college at Syracuse. Very good at lacrosse. Quint lacrosse analyst. Paths cross. Uh, somewhat famously, he complimented my tie during the national championship game of lacrosse in 2008 because I showed up to broadcast that for Syracuse Student Radio against his alma mater, Johns Hopkins, in a black shirt and a Hopkins blue tie. Syracuse won, and like for another two years after that, I made it a habit of wearing opponents' colors to games for good luck. Um, but I caught a little bit of flack from other uh, Syracuse folk for wearing enemy colors uh, in the press box at a national championship event. Uh, But Quint is very, very good at what he does, especially on the analyst side and the way he um, connects new people to lacrosse uh, and and explains the game, uh, but certainly also the way he captivates those that are experts in the game and watching because they have a vested interest in watching Uh, what is less and less of a niche sport uh, every single year. So uh, a bunch of different things to talk about with Quint. First and foremost, uh, the main things that he does. We'll talk about being an analyst like we've done in the past with other analysts on this podcast um, and what his role is, how you best work as a team with a play-by-play guy. We'll also talk about it from a reporter standpoint, from being a sideline reporter standpoint, uh, which I think was really interesting for me to hear how he approaches his job Um, and how play-by-play guys can work with their reporters um, down on the field to weave and create better storylines. But we'll talk about Quint as a play-by-play announcer as well, and uh, a variety of other topics, including uh, covering horse racing at the very end. So Quint Kesnick is our guest this week here on Play-by-Play Cast. And we start with where he started. He went to Johns Hopkins. He played goalie. He was the best in the country. But what did he want to do academically? Was this broadcasting thing at the the front of his mind when he went to school? Uh, Yay or nay? Here's Quint. I had no idea. I went there to uh, to play lacrosse and figure out what I wanted to do professionally. And uh, after college, I got a job with uh, Citibank. Actually, I interned there my last two years. And I was working for a Citibank uh, credit card division based in uh, Towson, Maryland, right right near, uh, at the time, Towson State. And I was in the HR, uh, and I was um, interviewing people for jobs in their collections and customer service department. And immediately I was uh, unhappy after, I don't know, six to nine months and, and realized that that uh, was not going to be my future. Where did the broadcasting bug come from? or did, like, did somebody put it in your ear, or did you think to yourself, hey, this is something I feel like I can do? Well, I started my first year out of college doing uh, Hopkins games, Johns Hopkins lacrosse games on radio as part of a three-man booth with Howard Mash and Bill Tanton. Uh, Howard was kind of a mid-Atlantic uh, play-by-play type guy, and uh, Bill Tanton was a longtime sports writer for the, for the Baltimore Sun and Baltimore Evening Sun. And immediately we had uh, terrific chemistry, and it was a lot of fun, and people felt that my contributions at the time were uh, – 
new, fresh, uh, different way to look at uh, at lacrosse. And and from there, I think I did two or three years on radio, and then we segued over to a small TV package through home team sports, about five games a spring, uh, and then that led to some work with uh, ESPN2 at the time, which was doing uh, indoor lacrosse, and then that led to ESPN Outdoor in 1995. And then from there, uh, it took me a handful of years to get involved with some other sports. So for my first year, 10 years out of college, uh, broadcasting was not my primary primary job. It was just uh, what I was doing on the side. Was there ever a thought that it could be, or was it one of those, hey, this is a fun side hustle? Well, no, right away I wanted it to be. It just, uh, you know, the way the business works, it's hard to get your foot in the door. Sure. At a, at a full-time capacity. So I was doing all sorts of things uh, TV-wise as much as I could in lacrosse and, and, and trying to spread my wings. I was lucky enough to get a break uh, somewhere, you know, mid-'90s where, uh, you know, I became the uh, the analyst for ESPN's lacrosse games, and the, the 95 championship. And then uh, they gradually gave me some chances to do college football. And, you know, there were basically one-game tryouts. It was... Uh, you know, move, pass, and move on, or or fail, and um, you know, be be done for life. So uh, there was a, some pressure situations, uh, but I enjoyed it. I felt comfortable. My dad was a high school football coach, and uh, you know, I played. So it was something that uh, that I that I was willing to take any opportunity and and try to capitalize. I feel like something we talk a lot about on this podcast is uh, being able to live in those moments and and relish those opportunities and not like totally freak yourself out when the chance comes along. Uh, how did you handle like the pressure situation? And obviously I have to imagine being a student athlete at some point and, and the level that you were comes into play there, but how do you handle this is my one shot, don't screw it up type mentalities and type opportunities uh, early on when you're trying to get your foot in the door? Well, number one would be preparation. You know, n- never let a lack of preparation get in your way. Whether you have the talent or not to do the job is, is a different story, but don't let preparation because anyone can prepare. So always showing up, being ready. You know, for me, I remember my second football game. It was uh, Northwestern at Penn State. I remember it clearly. It was more, I think Northwestern won. Randy Walker was their head coach. And before my halftime interview with Randy, I think this was on the Big Ten syndicated back when ESPN was televising a couple big games to regional markets. Uh, and I, I remember the halftime interview, Randy Walker must have looked at my face because he put his arm around me and said, don't worry, Quint, everything will be okay. Okay, this is the head coach before a halftime interview reaching around, and right at that moment I'm like, oh, wow, I kind of get why Randy's successful as, as a college football coach because he calmed me down. And then after the game I was able to get Paterno a lengthy interview. At the time, Joe was was – uh, I wouldn't. Not the easiest guy to, uh, to to get to talk. And our producer was like, "How did you get him to answer so many questions?" I'm like, well, I, I I grabbed his raincoat with my left hand. I put the mic in my right hand and wouldn't let him go until he answered three questions. Uh, he's like, "Good, uh, you're coming back next week. We'll, we'll see you next Saturday in Illinois." So you know, it was just uh, it was it was it was a game I'll never forget for, for those two reasons. Is it uh, like how do you handle the the idea of wanting to do more and wanting to move up in that role, and I, and I guess breaking out of the pigeonhole of he's the lacrosse analyst guy um, and, and saying, hey, I want to do more, I can do more, and, and finding those opportunities early on. It's, it's been a gradual progression, and I think over time you basically prove, your, prove what you can handle and what you can't handle. And for me, I've been lucky enough to work with you know, a dozen producers who all see my role maybe a little differently. You know, I've worked with some great play-by-play guys also, you know, whether it be Sean McDonough, Dave Pash, Mark Jones, Adam Amin. This year I'll be working with Jason Benetti. And, and in my, my Wednesday and Thursday games, working with you know, guys like Dave Lamont. So I'm exposed to a ton of announcers in, in my year, whether it's uh, football, lacrosse, wrestling, hockey. And one of my goals is always just to take the best of what they do and incorporate it into my game, whether it's preparation, whether it's talking to coaches, whether it's looking at film, whether it's an in-game strategy, whether it's just their mechanics, the way they operate Monday through Friday, 
how do they treat game day? You know, I'm always trying to learn, always trying to get better. And in terms of football, you know, my role has increased because you know, I have a great relationship right now with my producer, Mandy Cohen, who just trusts me. So when I get in talk back and say, hey, I can add on this running back, she knows that if she opens up my mic or if she has the play-by-play guy throw down at me, they're not going to get garbage, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. And so that's a trust that comes over time. And, you know, you, you, we, 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 we intently study our hits. You know, Mandy's incredible about feedback. So we'll go back after a game the following week and look at every single hit, and we talk about it. We said, that was a good one. That was average. That was bad. Let's not do that again. That was really good. Let's do something like this this week. And so, and so we learn. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's not an accident when it, because she is, she's so diligent and she's so uh, concerned with feedback. And so I've been fortunate to, uh, to be paired up with her for about the last four or five years. I don't want to put you on the spot, but it, you go back to the things that you, you talked about learning from people that you work with. Um, what types of things have you taken from the folks you've been able to, to be around and, and rub stuff off of? Um, anything in particular that comes to mind that's helped you just do this better? Well, in 2010, uh, when there was a little, there was a shakeup at ESPN. Uh, I think Aaron Andrews left college football, or somebody left, and there was a bump up, and so there was there was an open crew, and they they kind of threw me into a, a a slot that was uh, at the time, you know, quote unquote above my above my pay grade. But uh, I got to work with Sean McDonough for that year, <laughs> and Chris Spielman. Um, and Chris Chris and I remain really great friends now, but. You know, I learned a ton from Sean in terms of preparation and how to uniquely prepare. Everyone reads clips and everyone watches film. And, and I found with Sean's photographic memory that anything he read or was told would end up on our air. And if I was doing the same work that he was, uh, my points were not unique. They were redundant. Uh, and, and so that was a great season for me to learn that the reporter's role is to go elsewhere, to talk to the student manager, to talk to the assistant coach, to walk down the hallway in the facility and, and take the temperature of, of the, the safeties coach and to talk to athletes when you can at practice and, and to kind of circum, circumnavigate the typical channels of preparation, get to the game early, watch warm-ups, talk to the, talk to the quarterback about the ball, talk to the – running back about his gloves, talk to the receiver about his route tree, talk to the stadium guy about the turf, talk to the trainer about the common injuries he's seen lately, talk to the doctor about how to treat ACL, uh, just, just a ton of things to keep my content differentiated from, from the booth because, uh, you know, re- redundant content does not make for a great show. Well, nothing bad ever happened from asking people questions. Like, you're only going to get more no, information, better relationships. No, exactly. And on game day, people want to talk. You know, Fridays can be a little rough. You go in a football facility on a Friday and everybody's like a clam. They're not telling you anything about anybody, whether it's injuries, strategy, uh, whether they feel good or whether they feel bad. But something about Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon when they're on the field, two hours before kickoff, people are much more accommodating to talk, to loosen up, to admit strengths or weaknesses hey we think we can run the ball to the right today because their left tackles out with an injury or or you know uh, these, their corners aren't as big in person as they looked on tape or you know little things like that so typically the best stuff is from sight uh in the immediate moment that the fan up in the stands might not get a hold of and certainly the fan at home on the couch uh is benefiting from from that kind of type of content where do where's some of your creativity come for hits like i mean if, if you do a quick google search like you'll find the the cupcake hit of you talking about washington's schedule from football where like you're literally on the sideline with cupcakes um yeah which is i mean it it's funny it's different the normal it, it's not it's not normal it's not what it's not what the regular hit is going to look like um where did those types of ideas or what other kinds of ideas have you come up with to say this is visually different. This is a different way to, to make something stick in somebody's mind. Well, I mean, there, there are a couple guys in the business I think who do a great job. Tom Luganville's one who does terrific demos on the sideline. You know, he, he's a smart guy. He knows football well. He's, he's almost like a teacher on the sideline. 
So he, he's, he's done a great job at, at doing some demonstrations, whether it's a blocking technique, whether it's how to hold a football, how to throw a football. So I try to take one of those, you know, I go into every show hoping, you know, there's an opportunity to demo how this center for Georgia Tech cut blocks. If, if it arises, you know, let, let, let's see if we can we can scope this thing out. I'll get down in his stance. I'll show you his four-point stance. Hmm. So we're always, always thinking ahead like one demo. I'm always thinking ahead one prop. You know, sideline props are gold. Words become white noise. Uh, when people see things at home, whether it's a glove, whether it's, uh, you know, Bryce's loves uh, bloody bloody glove in, in the Alamo Bowl in the garbage, uh, visuals, props, we've become such a social media eight seconds or less. You know, it, our attention spans are nothing. We're like goldfish in a fishbowl. And if, if, if you don't have something visual, then the hit uh, doesn't resonate as, as strongly as it can. So, so I go in every game. And we'll talk about it during the week. And Mandy shoots me down a lot of times. Like, no, I don't like that. No, I don't like that. Well, that's got potential. Think about that. Or maybe when we're on site, we'll see something. We'll see something unique that the team does. Uh, so visual props and then demos, I think, can can really add to the, uh, the depth of a broadcast. How does a uh, – how's a, well, I guess we'll attack this from two ways. We'll start on the sideline aspect of it. But how does a play-by-play guy make a sideline reporter's job um, – easier and how do they best utilize them to to work as a, a really effective team well we're, we're communicating all week uh, and, and then the more you work with somebody the more you understand their pacing uh, it's really important for me to know what is on their agenda you know what they think the leads of this game are and then and then i work off of that and it's the same with my analysts so rod sent me clips early in the week i'm i'm asking him questions i'm saying what do you like about this uh you know, this, this Boise running game. And I know he's going to go there. I know my play-by-play is going to go there to talk about, you know, the Shea Patterson, the quarterback of Michigan. And so it's my job then to get the next layer. It's to go to the quarterback's coach and talk to him about Shea. It's to go to, it's to talk to Shea. It's, again, to avoid the redundancy yeah. of their work, but knowing that they're going to go there gives me an opportunity then to add a layer. Hey, I spoke to Shea before the game, and he said his biggest concern today was the wind when they head towards the uh, towards the open end of the stadium. Or, yeah, I talked to Shea today. He thinks there's opportunities thrown against their safeties when when they when they roll up and show blitz. Or, hey, I, you know, I spoke to Shea before the game, and he's going to use cadence to his advantage on third and short. Like, just, just knowing that our, our analysts, the guys upstairs, are going to go to a certain area then gives me the opportunity – to to, uh, to target content in that direction. From the analyst side, uh, if you're working with a niche calling lacrosse, uh, how does he make your life uh, easiest? And, and how do you like to be set up? And how do you how do you not like to be set up uh, to talk about certain things? Well, I mean, you know, anytime and I, and I do some play by play, and and I'm always I always learn so much by doing play by play, just because you realize what your windows are, what your analyst windows are. And, you know, ask questions. You know, for young play-by-play guys, I think there's a tendency in the industry not to want to ask questions because it sounds like you don't know what you're talking about. But to, to get to stimulate your analyst, to take your analyst inside the game, ask a simple question. What's it like for that goalie facing that shot? What's the biggest challenge that defender uh, is dealing with in that scenario? What's going on in the face-off man's head? The simple questions like that to, to take viewer into the game, I, I, I think across all sports and all shows, uh, I, I like play-by-play guys who, who, who engage and become more conversational by asking questions and less information. You know, there's a lot of stats and data uh, put out there by play-by-play guys that sometimes just kind of is noise. You know, if in doubt, lay out allow it to be quiet at times. I think viewers like that. And then ask your analyst more questions. Is there a, is there a balance there? Cause I've, I've gotten, I've, I've actually heard it both ways. I, a lot of people say ask questions, but I've also heard some people say certain analysts don't like getting questions in a certain way. Cause it, they feel like it puts them on the spot where they might not have an answer or there might not be a good answer. Um, how, how do you have the, the right, communication to know like hey you can ask me this because this will go somewhere or don't ask me this because 
yeah. I don't want to say the I don't want to say the answer or there is no answer. No, that's exactly correct. And and that's that's pre game communication, that's during commercials. I mean I'm working a game this Saturday, a pro game with Joe Beninati, and one of my things with Joe is, is during commercial breaks we will talk or, or we ha- we have a, a blank pad in between us. Uh, we have uh, maybe four or five pregame topics that we put on there. Some doubt, don't, don't you know? Go here. Let, let's talk general about these issues. And there's a list, and then there's a blank spot. And sometimes during commercials, I'll just put, "Hey, if it arises, ask me about this goalie on this next possession and his angle play." Uh, and if it doesn't, it, 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 we don't get there. But so that communication is is critical. Uh, pregame half times any commercial breaks you know when i'm working sideline during football games what's so important for me is we go to commercial break just raise my mic up for 15 seconds we've got a two minute break let's say just to check in hey you know hey rod you need anything what are you looking at you know uh you guys you guys okay you know uh 27 just went off with an ankle injury just wanted you guys to know that just just a little communication in game uh, makes a big difference that way. And I think that references, you know, when I'm an analyst and don't want to go someplace, I make sure that, that I tell the, uh, the play-by-play guy, hey, don't ask me about this kid who's not playing today who got suspended. Because A, I don't know, and, and, and B, I don't want to go there. How do you deal with teaching the game? Uh, and again, I'm particularly lacrosse, and it's become it's become obviously bigger over the years, but if you want to go back, I mean, even 10 or 15 years ago, like I, I know Rhino always used to say, you know, when a, when a goalie stopped a shot, Dave would always talk about how much time he had to get rid of the ball or how much time he had to clear. Um, what's the responsibility that you you have as an analyst, and how do you like to approach um, teaching the game to people but also towing the line of understanding that you don't want to dumb it down too much for an educated audience? Yeah, that's the hardest part with lacrosse because our audience is a complete spectrum of experts to people watching the sport for the first time. So somewhere along the line, you know, there are teachable moments that, that I think it's important that you do. Uh, you, you, you teach, you, but you, you just say, hey, that, that's, a, that's a terrific goal by, by Sam because he did X, Y, and Z. And what coaches emphasize there is the way when he rolls back, he squares up his hips to the goal or, or whatever. So I, they're, they're, that's definitely, you know, to teach without – being too elementary without being too over people's heads and using jargon and, and too much insider lingo. Uh, that's a fine line. And that's something I've always felt conflicted about when I do lacrosse games. The regular season game, the hardcore are watching, I may open it up a little bit and, and be a little more detailed to that kind of thing. Late in the season, NCAA playoffs, when our audience is bigger and, and maybe less, uh, less savvy, you know, we, we have, I don't want to say dumb it down, but we have to be basic. And, you know, at times we have to say, hey, this is lacrosse. you got to keep four guys back on defense at all times or that's offside. There's four long sticks on the field. You know, things that are very rudimentary and common, we have to get into the broadcast just, just to benefit everybody. So that, that that is a big challenge, especially in lacrosse. Well, and I laughed, too. It was sometime during the spring somebody tweeted at Anish because he called the Tawarta on the Heisman Trophy of lacrosse. And they were like, are we beyond the point where we have to say that? And somebody else replied and pointed out the fact that it's literally in the Twitter bio of the Tuarton is that it's the Heisman Trophy of lacrosse. So it's like finding the fine line of, of what is what is right for for what audience. Um, I thought it was interesting, but yeah, no, and, and that was that was a little bit of a running joke for us during the playoffs. <laughs> um, let me ask you about the play by play side of things. Um, when did like was that ever an inkling of in your mind this is something I want to try or is that something they came to you and said hey would you like to give this a try um, and what was your initial reaction? Uh, it was it was exciting you know I, I've done a handful of basketball games over the years and then more and more lacrosse games uh, and it's a challenge you know like I did the Under Armour boys and girls games this year and had memorizing eighty eight <laughs> names and numbers was was, was a cha- was a chore and it doesn't come easy for me. Uh, even after going to practices and, and look, taking visual cues. So I'm always learning. You know, working with a guy like Joe Beninati in that regard, we've been working together for 20 years, uh, and he's a pro's pro in terms of preparation, uh, memorization and names and numbers, calling a game. Uh, just, just he's so buttoned up and so detailed that every, every time I work as an analyst for Joe, I'm, I'm uh, in awe 
uh, of his vocabulary uh, and, and just his ability to dance around situations. Uh, you know, and, and the other guys I've worked with, you know, Sean McDonough's ability to story tell at the proper times of a game, uh, just magnificent, his use of humor, magnificent. So I'm always learning every, every game I do. I'm like, ah, that was a, that was a B plus or that was a C minus. And I go back and I'm like, well, next time I'm going to do this better. Um, I'm going to lay out here. I'm going to call that goal with more impact that you called that goal with too much impact. It was one, one in the first quarter. It's no big deal. Uh, so there's so many scenarios. Uh, and if you're truly a pro, you're just uh, constantly self evaluating And then, you know, it's not to say my, there's voice issues. You know, I don't have the, the classic play by play voice. And so, uh, it's not easy. Uh, but, but every time I do it, I think I get better as a, as a, as an announcer, regardless of what my role is, because, because it, it really becomes eye opening. And and helps me become a better analyst. Helps me become a better uh, field reporter. Um, did you have like a moment where you? I, I don't know how you like how you went into it. Did you think it would be one thing and it turned out to be another, or did you th- like did you think it would be harder than it truly was? And once you got into the groove of it, you're like, oh, okay, I, I've just moved over a chair. I'm just I'm still doing the same product. How did that hit you? Well, no, it's. I think the confidence I can do this. Uh, it takes more work for me um, because the role is different, and th- and then depends on the sport and and, uh, and the uh, size of, the, of of if I'm doing a Johns Hopkins lacrosse, I know those guys by heart. You know, <laughs> just, if I'm doing uh, like the Thunder Armor thing last week or a, a women's game, it's it's a it's a little more challenging. Um, but so the confidence is there to do it. I have done it. It's just a matter of putting in the work, relaxing, calling the game, uh, maintaining communication with the producer and and, and analyst, and, and just uh, trying to smooth it smooth it out. Uh, and more reps, obviously. Rep, reps are critical. How has it made you a better reporter and a, and a better play-by-play guy? I know, I know we talked about the relationship a little bit already, but what what did you maybe not know, uh, even all these years of doing it in the the analyst chair, that that you learned just shifting over a seat? Well, I mean, simple things like why isn't Joel in the game right now? You know, I, I got Joel is supposed to be running uh, power forward, or, or we're supposed to be starting at uh, at midfield, and all of a sudden he's not in the game. Uh, what, where where do he go? You, you know, uh, understanding that there are times when the play-by-play guy needs needs to be the voice of the show. Understanding that there are other times where it's better for the play-by-play guy just to lay out for a second, either let the show breathe or let the analyst talk. Uh, how to set the analyst up prior to a penalty situation or a big face-off or a timeout. Uh, you know, those, those type of things. Uh, just more structural things within a show, like uh, how, the skeleton of the show, how the, how the show is going to flow and how everyone's going to be maximized. Uh, it really helps to see it from, from the play-by-play role. You talked about watching stuff back as well. How much do you watch back? Um, and I guess does it vary based on on what it is? Yeah, you know, I watch lacrosse guys. I don't watch tons back. You know, it's such an industry that's moving forward. I mean, my preparation for football is constantly moving forward. You know, we get our assignments typically on a Sunday afternoon at two o'clock, and by Sunday night, I'm hoping to have some film done for the following week. Monday's a a huge film day for me. I, I love to watch the team's last TV version. What stories have recently been told? Yeah. What what did they gloss over? Uh, so I'll watch as much TV versions lately, and then I go back and I'll try to watch a lot of highlights of, of earlier action where we're going to see trends develop, how this team scores, uh, what this team, how this team gives up points, uh, and 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 then on, obviously when we're on site, we're watching cut-ups of situations, whether it be first downs, third downs, or red zone, I, f- I found to be the most valuable. Uh, and that's just something I didn't mention earlier. You know, situational awareness for a sideline reporter is critical also, because I'll, I'll go into games. I mentioned props, demos, but I'll go into a game with two or three situations that I've hashed out with the analyst and, and with the uh, with our producer. Like, hey, if they get it in the red zone, high red zone, and it's a first down, be ready. I'm going to give you a quick hit on how they like to run their trick plays here. Or 
be ready because I may talk about their wide receiver has a height advantage over this corner if that matchup shows up. So there's there's situational awarenesses or personnel package. Hey, if they go jumbo on a fourth and short and there's a little time, I want to talk about how they're going to run it behind the D tackle that they put in a fullback. Mm. Uh, so the, the, those situations, and that's where to watch the tape is you, you, you can't do your job without watching tape and being prepared that way. I want to ask you one more thing. Um... On a, on a sideline reporting note, um, because, uh, again, I mentioned if you, if you do a Google search of Quinn Kesnick, um, that's how I found the cupcake line. You will also find uh, the, the, the Bo Pelini and Mark D'Antonio interactions. And, and I laugh because uh, at Ball State, sometimes our sideline reporter uh, will get, uh, he, he gets the cold shoulder sometimes at halftime because we've got a pretty intense coach now. And our color guy always looks at me when we go to break and he goes, man, that's a tough job. Uh, what uh, what's it like when you run into a situation where a coach is prickly in a spot like that? And and I guess the D'Antonio one stuck out to me in particular because he basically brushed off the first question, and then put you on the spot to immediately ask a second, and then for you to hey regroup real quick and come back with something. Um, what happens in those moments, and and how do you handle being thrust into a situation that is uh, not often an enviable one to be in? No, it, it it's. Uh... It's challenging because it, it, it's immediate. But, you know, in Mark's case, we, we had a, a great relationship that goes back to when he was a Cincinnati coach when I was just starting in the business, and I covered a lot of his games there. He called me on Sunday personally on my cell phone to apologize. Uh, and there's, so there's respect there. There, there's, uh, there's, I understand that he's got a job to do. I understand that he may not want to an, uh, answer my question. Uh, but I, I have a job to do, and at times I'm going to have to ask a, a difficult question. Uh, so, so there is that; those are can be stressful moments. My goal is two things: a halftime interview should either get good content, okay, get the fan some answers, get the fan uh, some strategic view of the game, maybe that's going on in the coach's head, or to capture their temperament and. In both of those cases, you clearly capture the temperament <laughs> yep. of Mark D'Antonio and Bo Pelini. And so for the fan who's on the couch, boom, all of a sudden you're on the sideline and you realize, I, I, I don't know what's going on with Michigan State or Nebraska right now, but their coach is hot. They're, their coach is hot. And this locker room at halftime is going to be an interesting place, and let's we'll see how they react to play in the second half. So, so capturing content or emotion are the two things that, that you're trying to go for uh, with halftime interviews. That's interesting. I, I I never thought about it in those terms, but that makes a lot of sense because it it without them actually saying a whole lot of anything, it puts into perspective their their state of thing. mind. Yeah, no, they don't have to say a thing. That's exactly right. Their temperament, their attitude, their you know how they're feeling is is clear. You know, and if a coach is also you know very sedate and passive, well, then that's generally a good sign. Sometimes guys will throw you curveballs, but you know. I don't tell them what I'm going to ask before they throw it to us, and I typically try to ask a short, uh, specific question, uh, hoping for a good answer. And many times you don't get a good answer, but all you can do is ask the best question that, that you can formulate. I'll end on this uh, this note with you, if I can go uh, bring it full circle back to the beginning of your career. Um, and we didn't we didn't we haven't talked about this at all yet, but I know you, did you, you started as a print reporter for horse racing, correct? Uh, that was uh, 2002, three and four up in Saratoga. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. What is what is having been a writer do for you in terms of communication and, and impact and um, how you appear on television, how you talk on television, having been a, a a true print writer and thinking about things in that fashion. Well, you know, I for. I typically jot down notes when, when, when I speak, like when I do an open. There, there are other guys I know who, like, memorize their opens. Uh, well, Joel's a 6'4 quarterback. He's, <laughs> you know, like, they memorize. I, I'll just, I'll, I'll write down three bullet points. So, uh, and I'm better off just kind of talking to the camera. Sure. Uh, so, so my writing background doesn't come in, come in handy that way. That, you know, that, that experience working for the Saratoga special for those three summers up there was, was uh, tremendous in that it took me out of my comfort zone. Uh, you know, for in lacrosse, everybody knows who I am in racing. When I was up there, nobody knew who I was. So I had to 
establish relationships with everybody. Every single day I was meeting somebody for the first time. Every single day I was trying to establish and, and work on new relationships. So so that that's the, the biggest plus of that was, you know, being being uh, out of my comfort zone yeah. and, and, and surviving. No, that's a that's a good lesson to take away from it too, because we all as we all get into something that we're uncomfortable with, be it any niche sport um, that you try to try to open up a yeah, door. Yeah, you in. fall the, and you fall in the traps exactly. You fall in the traps because well, I know coach, and you're meeting with them, and you know it's it's just when when you're put somewhere new, uh, it, it's it's stimulating. So so that was that was a huge positive. Quinn, if people want to find you on social media or catch you on television, uh, what's the best way to, to get more Quint uh, Kessenich in their life? Uh, what is it? At Q Kessenich Twitter, I think would be the best way. Cool. It's K-E-S-S-E-N-I-C-H. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, laying low this summer, Twitter-wise, on occasional posts. I'm doing some pro lacrosse, and then college football starts. I just got back from the America Athletic uh, Conference uh, media days in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, that was the lobster. Was, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the lobster the clam bake was good, but I, I got to tell you, like every coach in that league, uh, I, I've got history with. Whether it's Mike Houston, you know, just coming from JMU, where it's the FCS championship game, we spoke. Dana Holgerson, I go way back with. Randy Edsel, when UConn won the Big East, yeah. did that game when they beat uh, South Florida. Uh, Luke Fickle, a longtime assistant in Ohio State, when I was there covering signing days and all those Buckeye games when Urban was a coach. You know, Luke and I used to just chill in the hallway and talk about players. Uh, just just uh, tons and tons of guys in that league. Uh, Sonny Dykes was out Cal, caught three Cal games one year. The good one against Texas early in the year, that high-scoring game. And uh, It's just amazing how I feel like I've stayed with ESPN for now more than, let's say, a dozen years, and all the parts in the coaching world have changed around me, but they've kind of remained the same. Yeah. They've just moved to different spots and different roles, and, and you know that's why I love covering the Mac, because I made a relationship with P.J. Fleck, Dino Babers, Mark D'Antonio, Brian Kelly. I mean, you know, and the staff, not to mention the, the, the assistants yep. that started those places and who worked their way up. So that, it's a huge value to me to go do those games. People are like, well, why do you want to do those games? I'm like, I love those games. That's pure college football, and it's, uh, it's the form- formation of, of great relationships. All right, that is Quint Kesnick joining us here on Play by Playcast. If you take nothing else from this conversation, what he said about Sean McDonough and working with Sean McDonough and how he knew Sean was going to have all his prep bases covered, so he had to find something else, I thought was very interesting. Because as a play by play guy, like, just apply that to yourself. If you don't have a sideline reporter, what else can I bring beyond what I would normally find in research and preparation. And then if you do have a sideline reporter, I've got one on the radio. We use them on our ESPN3 broadcast from time to time. That's something that's good um, in my point of view. I I deal with a lot of students. Um, That's good for them to know and working with them and molding them in terms of, hey, how do you best contribute? Well, look for that next piece, that next thing. Um, But it's also good to know as a play-by-play person of, how to guide them, how to steer them, how to how to incorporate a play uh, a, an analyst and a sideline reporter uh, into a broadcast when you sit down and have a meeting and talk about what you want to do and how you want to tell stories. Uh, that's a really good spot for them, and I, I think it was cool to hear Quint uh, verbalize exactly where he feels he fits in best to that picture and how it. Um, best makes a broadcast better. So uh, cool to dive into those topics this week with Quint Kasnick. We're out of time, though. We're off till next week, so we're back here next Friday morning. Until then, I'm Joel Gadet, and this is Play by Playcast. We are out. And that will do it from St. Louis, where the score is inconclusive.